by grace. I've been saved by grace. My name is in the book of life, and my sins are washed away. Saved by grace. I've been saved by grace. It's not what I deserve, but I'm saved by grace. We welcome you to today's program of Not Without Blood. We thank you for joining us and we hope you'll take your Bible and a notepad maybe and follow along with us as we study God's Word. We hope it will be challenging to you. We hope we will, we will bring out some things that will make you think and make you go to the Word of God and study. We know that uh, in my walk with God in the last few years, I've been challenged on numerous, numerous things about what I did believe in what the Word of God said. And when that comes to point in a person's life, they really have to decide which way am I going to go? Am I going to go with the Word? And of course all of us would say that we would. But that is harder than what we might think. When the Word challenges me on a position that I have held for years, it may take months and years to get rid of that position in my life. It may take a as long a time as I've been believing it to get rid of it because we really don't let go of things too easily once they have been ingrained in us. As we go through... Uh, the Word of God in this study, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at why the church is in the position that it is in today. Uh, how did it get in that position? When did it start? Did it start 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 2,000, 4,000 years ago? Uh, are we on track with the Word of God? Are we, in some cases, off track? You know, we continually need to examine where we are with God so complacency does not set in so that the Word of God will always be fresh to us and it, it's not just a case of, of reading a few verses or a chapter before I go to bed at night. But it, it's uh, deriving a relationship that only the Holy Spirit can produce in my life. Of deriving truth and knowledge through revelation, through understanding that only the Holy Spirit can give me. <clears throat> I cannot do that in my own thought or in, in my own ability. I have to have the power source of the Holy Spirit to produce that change and to make it real in my life. I can say I'm going to change, but without the source of the power of the Spirit, I really do not stand a chance in changing either something that I am in bondage to, something that uh, I may be believing that is not correct according to the Word of God, something that... Uh, I may be legalistic in uh, any item that does not line up true with the Word of God is a point of conjecture for the Word and for the Spirit to bring us into a line with what the Word says. As we uh, go through our study, uh, we want to pray before we start that the, God would anoint this word and anoint the people to receive it. Father, we submit this to you. We submit this study and all studies to you. And we just thank you, Lord, for the uh, uh, ability and the wherewithal to bring God's word to God's people, no matter where they are, what they're doing. Father, may you give us favor with your people and the, the people that you want us to have favor with that they would receive the truth of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at a issue in the nation of Israel's life and a snapshot in that on today's program. 
uh, there came a time in their life when the nation did not want to move. They became complacent in where they were. They became content to stay in one place. They decided that they were satisfied in staying in one place. The problem with that, God did not want them to stay in a place, but he wanted them to pursue what he had designed for them. He had a land called Canaan that was full of uh, blessings that he had laid out for them. He, his desire was for them to go in and possess it. He had already given it to them. So the issue was not whether or not they could possess it, but whether or not they would believe God and go after what God had desired for them to go after. If they stayed in one place, then that would hinder them from pursuing God's promises. And I'm sure you can see as we go through a couple of verses and a couple of things on today's program, how eerie similar this is to the modern day church. Do we become complacent with what we're doing, with where we are in our relationship with God? Or are we continually growing in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior each and every week? If we're not growing in God, then we're like a pond full of water, but the water is not moving and it will eventually become stagnant. If there's not an inflow of water and an outflow of water to refresh, to renew, to bring life, then that pond will cease to be a source of life as God would design it to be, and it would just become stagnant. Eventually, it would become like the Dead Sea. God wants us to have an influx from His Holy Spirit into our life on a daily basis, on a basis that He can give us revelation of His Word and His plan and His purpose for us. But we cannot sit still. So we're going to look at a scripture tonight starting out in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And if you'll turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 6, uh, we're going to read uh, verses 6, 7, and 8. And the word says, The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey. Go up to the hill country of the Amorites and to all of their neighbors and in the hill country and the low land and, in, and by the sea coast, the land of Canaanites and Lebanon and as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, in verse 8, See, I have set this land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them, to, to them and their offspring after them. To set the picture here, Israel is camping at Mount Sinai, made several trips around the mountain, but now they were just camping in one spot. They were staying there. They had become, again, satisfied, complacent, content. Uh, they were not interested in moving. They basically had lost hope of ever fulfilling the promise of God in their life. They knew from their forefathers that God had uh, promised this land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew where, what the land contained. Uh, Moses had sent scouts in. They knew there was a land of milk and honey. They also knew there was enemy there. But they had let the promise of God slip from them that they could possess it. 
that he had given it to them. It was not something that they had to go purchase or buy or do anything but do what God told them to do by faith. They could possess the land by faith if they would go in and possess it as he told them to. Now, if they got off track, then his, that didn't work. But only when they stayed on track did they defeat their enemy. Did the word of God become so powerful in their life that their enemy was defeated and defeated and defeated. Right now they're sitting in camp and God is trying to prod them and telling them, listen, you have been here talking about Mount Sinai long enough. It's time for you to move. To put uh, Israel's experience into perspective for our benefit today, you have to see that the Mount Sinai experience would be as if a spiritual experience. They would have to uh, understand that this was their spiritual state uh, as far as the type and shadow of what the church would be today. Mount Sinai represented the law of Moses that the law was given to Moses and they had decided that they would tell God that we can do whatever you want us to do. And Mount Sinai represented a spiritual experience for Israel. So they were complacent and satisfied in their current spiritual experience. They were not about change. They were not about going on and pursuing the blessings of God that he had promised them. They were about just staying where they were, doing what they had been doing without changing at all. Uh, this is an enemy in the modern church, in the church of today that we have accepted routine. We have accepted how that the routine of our Christian experience has really become our Lord because it determines how we are going to do things in whatever church we're going to uh, be going to. Think about your own church. Uh, programs. They're organized and, and the conditions are set up and then, you know, everybody says, well, we accept that as normal because this is something we set up and this is normal for this church. Uh, anyone can predict what the Sunday service is going to be like. It's going to be this. It's going to follow this. Then we're going to have this take place, this take place, and then we're going to dismiss. So the predict, the being able to predict the Sunday service before you walk in, if you've been in most churches more than five or six times, even as a newcomer, you can predict what will take place. This is really uh, unacceptable as far as God is concerned, uh, I think. When we come to a place that everything can be predicted, and nobody expects anything unusual from God, then we're in a rut. And we've got to determine somehow if we're in a rut and then how to get out of it. But the biggest thing you can determine if you are in a rut is can you predict the order and the service before you walk in? Is there any room for anything unusual for what the Holy Spirit may want to do? If God wanted to move, is there a place set aside for Him to do that? Or would you set aside your entire service on a weekly basis and just allow the Spirit to speak to us? We have to determine these things or we can get in a rut and the routine will dictate how we go forward. When we uh, 
when routine dictates and we can tell not only what will happen next Sunday, but a lot of times we can tell what will happen next month. And if things don't change, we can tell what will happen six months from now, uh, even a year from now, because we have gotten into the formality or the rut of religion. You know, if, if you were to go to a cemetery, everybody acts the same. There is no expectation of anything or anyone acting any different. There's no expectation of anything changing. Uh, whether there are people going through a service at a cemetery or people that are there. There are people sleeping in graves. There are people visiting. But nobody expects anything different from going to a cemetery. That is how it is. That is what is expected. No change. But the church is not a cemetery. The church is the living body of Christ. And as such, and as he is the head, the body is not dead. But even though we may act like a cemetery sometime and function as a cemetery sometime, that is not what God wants. He does not want us to be in a routine. He does not want us to be in a rut. He does not want us to take for granted uh, how this service is going to be, how the service is going to be next month, and, and have no time for His Spirit to move upon His people through either His spoken word, through the singing of songs that glorify Him? Do we expect the Spirit of God to move on a, on a congregation or on individuals when we go to church? If we don't expect the Spirit of God to move, something is wrong. Are we just going to church to uh, fulfill a religious obligation? Are we going to church to be seen? Are we going to church to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior? We should be challenged by that and we have to determine that on an individual basis. We have to determine why we are going to church. Another way to put it, how, how have you changed in the last three months, six months, or a year? How have you changed by going to church? How has church changed you? How have you grown? How have you benefited other than by socially meeting people that you love? How have you benefited spiritually? Uh... Can you say you've grown spiritually? Can you say on, on a month-to-month -month basis that I'm closer to God now than I was last month? Can you say that the Holy Spirit is breaking down the walls of religion in my life and speaking to me more on a daily basis, not just when I may be inside the four walls of a building, but we are the church. We are where God resides. <clears throat> so are we hearing Him on a more consistent basis? Are we hearing Him louder and stronger? Is His voice becoming more real to us? Can we distinguish His voice from the voice uh, of the world? Then we know that we're growing in God. When he tells us little things and those little things become big things, we know that we are continually growing in his goodness and grace. You know, we always want to blame somewhere or something else for the lack of spiritual growth. We want to blame uh, anyone. We'll blame the enemy. We'll blame... Uh, the last times. Well, you know, this is harder than it's ever been. 
uh, everybody knows how hard it is and it's just hard to get people to come into church and it's this is the last days and and uh, you know God will just understand because being it is the last days he's not going to expect as much of us as he did somebody two or three hundred years ago but that's wrong in the last days he wants his body to become stronger he wants his army to be stronger because if we're not stronger than we were and the people were two or three hundred years ago or two or three months ago then the enemy is going to have an easier time to come in and wreak havoc in our congregation in our personal life in our family life in our extended family life we see how uh, the walls have broken down where it's hard to distinguish between the world and what goes on in the body of Christ these days. But we can't blame it on anyone else. We have to look within. You know, some of the things that I've seen uh, people do is, is look outside and look at all the circumstances rather than looking inside you know in, in, in churches nowadays we don't have anybody that's going to stand up and deny that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses we're not going to have Christians deny that Jesus walked on water we're not going to have people deny that Jesus healed people during his earthly ministry uh, if we want to have prayer meeting all night long we're not going to have the government come in and tell us we can't uh, we're not going to have people stand up in church and, and, and deny that Jesus is the son of God so when we look to blame and we look at all that we have we readily see that it's not the external forces that are causing spiritual decline. It, it's how we take, uh, how we look on the inside of us, how we take account of our spiritual relationship with the Father. Have we become like Israel? <clears throat> Have we camped out at a congregation? Have we become content? Have we become complacent? Are we satisfied with what we are doing? See, that's the reason Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 6 through 8 did not want to move. The reason God was having to tell them to move and go on to what I have promised you because they were essentially satisfied. They were not uh, eager to possess more of the things of God. Did they know about them? Yeah, they had been told. Uh, their forefathers had handed down the promises of God. God had established His covenant through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob. He reiterated His covenant all the way that I have given you this land. I want you to go possess it. So he demonstrates his power and what he has done. He demonstrates his will in saying, go and possess it. Israel, sitting back, I'm comfortable. I'm going to sit on my hands. I'm going to go through the routine. I'm going to go through the rut. I'm going to just uh, go and worship God the way I've been taught to worship God. I'm going to probably read... Uh, a little bit of my Bible before I go to bed at night. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to make any change in my life or not. Maybe it will. I don't know, but I feel like if uh, I feel better if I do it than if I don't do it. So when God asked me through His Spirit, some well, you know, I read my Bible every day last week. But my question and the Holy Spirit's question, how much are you growing? Are you moving or are you standing still? God again 
Peter tells us to grow in the grace and goodness of our Lord. He does not tell us to sit still. He does not tell us to be complacent. If we sit still, we are inviting the enemy to take more and more ground. We cannot take back the ground that the enemy has stolen in our personal life, in our family life, in our extended family life, in our church life, in our neighborhood life, or in the life of this country. We cannot take back without fighting. You know, people are declaring the United States now as not a Christian nation. I do not accept that because God has always had a remnant. And if the remnant will rise up, pray and, and seek God's face and go after the enemy the way he wants us to go after. You know, the enemy has been defeated. All you have to do is read Colossians 2 verses 13 and 14. You will see where God, through Jesus and, and what His finished work was on the cross, defeated Satan, made an open show of Him, and totally and utterly took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So it's not our job to defeat the enemy. We are not fighting a victorious foe we sometimes have this mentality that we have to defeat the enemy all over again. No, the enemy has been defeated. We approach him from a point of victory. We do not approach him from a point of trying to win. You know, as we've looked at Scripture today and talked a little bit about the place of, of the modern day church, we just ask that you would examine your own life as I have to examine my life and see where you are in your spiritual walk with God. Are you sitting in a tent and camping? Or are you an army and are you marching forward to possess what Jesus has won for us through the cross? We hope that you will grow with us, continue to watch uh, not without blood with us. We hope you make it a matter of, of your uh, daily routine of, of studying the Word of God with us. And we're so pleased and thankful that you join us today. Join us again tomorrow and may God bless you. Not Without Blood has been brought to you by the donations of the Crossway Ministry sponsors. If you'd like to join our sponsors in support of our ministry, contact us at 256-227-5777. We invite you to join us each and every study to grow in the knowledge of the finished work of Christ. Once again, that number is 256-227-5777.